brought the blues to us white kids uh, first mm -hmm. through the Butterfield Band. We, we heard it in Dylan, you know, what, what he was doing with Dylan, the Butterfield Band. And um, it was, what is this? You know, who are these? Look at this guy. It, what is he? First of all, he had a lot of... A lot of hair, a big a Jufro, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Chicago guys, high energy, you know, guy like this, and his playing was that way, and it was go for it, and maybe not make it every time, which is uh, the, the charming thing to me. The thing that turned me on was, wow, this guy, he he went for that, but he didn't make it. It wasn't like perfect out of the box. I practice this stuff at home. It was pretty much heart to hand, you know, the way uh, Hubert Sumlin plays and a lot of the old old guys. They're not thinking. There's no thought process. It's really just soul, you know. And Mike had that uh, energy. When I started a band with Harvey, and uh, uh, this before we did a thing with Al Cooper, he said, "Man, you need a Les Paul. I know you're into Michael, but you're playing the Strat, you know." So, so Harvey gave me his his Les Paul to use until I got one, and that was a P90 Sunburst guitar from like 1970, 69. 70. Then I went and got one, you know, so, um, and then I, the burst thing came uh, a little bit later with Super Session. Mm -hmm. Obvious change in sound mm -hmm. between uh, Albert Shuffle and Texas, mm -hmm. you know, it's two templates of, of just some great guitar playing. And um, then that was it for me, was burst, because I then discovered Bino, you know. We put a band together with Al Cooper called The Recuperators. We started playing around with Anton and Anton Fig on drums and Harvey Brooks. And we cut some records and did some gigs. We used to play the bottom line all the time and Joe Walsh would come and sit in with us and I just had a deluxe reverb. And this crap on the floor, you know, just like a MXR stuff. And Joe came to sit in and he just took my Les Paul and he unplugged it from that, stuck it in the amp. He turned the amp all the way up, man, and just went here, you know, and, and there was a, a sound that I was trying to step on a pedal to get, you know, and then I realized that when he was playing rhythm, he just, he just rolled it back and boy, I said, oh, that's what that knob does. That's the rhythm knob. And then, you know, and, you know, wow, there's tones in here, you know, so... That was the thing, of course you need a tuner. So then Al said, I told you, just plug in and turn up, man, you know. He told me, you know, Joe had to show me. And I still thank him for it, you know, and I know that you, you can do a lot of stuff on the guitar. And this one will hold pretty good by itself, you know. I mean, Hendrix didn't have a volume pedal on a lot of stuff either, so, you know, he would, he would turn down two for rhythm. Turn down for rhythm and then B.B. King does that. B.B. King turns the amp up all the way. Michael used to turn the two two twins up all the way, but then still control it from here. And, you know, and that's how you also get the, the woman tones. By using, you know, your tone control. Another uh, sweet trick. You know, if you have a Firebird 1 or, a, uh, you know, you have a Les Paul Jr., you're going to learn about these knobs a lot quicker. <laughs> you know, because you don't have many options. You have one pickup and then... Les always tried to get the cleanest sound he could out of his guitar. I think that he would probably be proud of it, would probably pawn it eventually for something <laughs> or other, and that would make it really just like his old guitar. That's the only thing. Uh, I, I'm sure that, you know, we, we always marvel over this, and I know what that is. When you, get, when, you, when you get a string stuck back here, and you take, I used to take a compass, you know, a pointy <laughs> compass, and try to get back here. This could be also his thumb, thumbnail fits right in there perfect. Trying to get that stuck string out of there, you know. A screwdriver, you know, whatever. That's, uh, you know, you can do this yourself to your own guitar, you know. You can, you can buy the knobs, yes. You can, um, you can do what you want, except that uh, it's, got, it's just got burst buckers in it, which are just fabulous in anything that I have. And um, the thing is, about something as charming as this, or the Johnny Winter, the dead-on Johnny Winter, or the page. Sometimes, you know, we like to play dress-up, and we put it on, and we feel like 
there's something you get of the feeling of the player in you. And with Michael, you know, to me, to have it look so much like his guitar, it means a lot. Uh, of course, it doesn't change. If I picked up a new one here, I could play the same stuff. But the inner feeling of it being, oh, this is a Mike Bloomfield guitar, it's important to me and to a lot of players, you know. Well, the Fab Four came about because Will and I both doing TV shows uh, on the same schedule, lived in the same building on Mercer Street. He had called me and said, where are you living? I said, I'm at 300 Mercer. He goes, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move in there. I said, oh, great. Neither of us are there anymore, so don't look for us. <laughs> so anyway, I was giving away the ad. We just weren't, we weren't, we were there, you know, we were there, and we, be, you know, the elevator was him going to work, me going to work, getting on the train, whatever, or in the car, whatever we were doing, and uh, coming home at the same time. And, uh, hey, you know, what's up? Let's start a Beatle band. I said, yeah, okay, see you tomorrow. You know. Let's start a Beatle band next day. Ah, oh, come on, man. You see, you're messing with me now because who, why would you? Why would you even think of doing that? He says because uh, nobody's doing it just from the standpoint of the music. So he was getting serious now. He said there's a lot of wigs and nose bands out there, and you know, dress up bands and Halloween Beatle bands out there. But nobody's really looking at this as serious music. And Will is probably one of the top three musicians in the world that I know. You know. <laughs> so uh, Will says, um, I got a, this guy, Rich Pagano. I was playing with him with Hiram in Japan. And, you know, Hiram was always late for sound check. So, so we would just start playing Beatle grooves, bass and drums. And I, I realized this guy knew everything, you know, Rich. He goes, and I started getting into the Paul thing, like, again, realizing this is some of the best bass playing ever on record, you know. So they started doing that, and they looked for some other guys. And uh, he said, I've been thinking, if, why don't you come over? You know, I'm getting two other guys and you. We're going to be five. We're going to be the Fab Foe, F-A-U-X, which means we're not four and we're not going for, you know. I understand that. We're five, yeah. Yeah, so I go up there and he says, well, let's do something. Well, he's got acoustic guitars laying around the keyboard, you know. He said, uh, let's do, uh, let's, let's work on Because, you know. I said, the first thing? He said, yeah, if we can do that, then we can have a band. So we put it on, we listen. Guys are taking notes, writing down numbers, writing down notes, whatever they need to do. I'm looking at the book of the, because I have to play harpsichord, because I'm the one guy that said, I guess I can play keyboard, because I can. Right. So I'm reading the thing and learning it, and, and I, now I have to play it and sing a part. So we work on that, we work on that really for about five hours. So we did it, and then we said, okay. And then we just started di dishing out songs. We took about four songs each. They said, come back next week. And then we started dry rehearsals, doing this stuff. And once we got about 20 songs together, we booked a gig. You know, we started rehearsing, and uh, we've been doing it 13 years now. So the scariest thing for me is uh, standing between Derek Trucks and Warren Haynes on stage with Greg Allman singing and, <laughs> and Butch and, you know, and, uh, and J-Mo and, uh, and O'Teal, you know, uh, and uh, I guess uh, Mark, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, greatest experiences getting between those two guys, looking out into the audience and saying, "What am I doing in between these two guys?" Uh, you know, Derek Trucks uh, has the best tone right now out of anybody. Him and Warren, you know, really Warren's tone conscious. Like, you know, it's the volume control, it's the tones. Derek just plugs in a brand new, you know, not a vintage, a brand new SG set up an open E and just you know into this amp nothing uh, practicing unsafe guitar <laughs> you know nothing between the guitar and the amp uh, and that's it you know and uh, it's all in the fingers you know and that's what uh, Muddy Waters always said that's what BB King does you know um, you can hear a guy play you know dry and know what you're hearing Right. you're going to hear later, you know, and uh, the pedals don't do the work for you. I mean, I, I, I appreciate them, especially in a Fab Faux situation, where you have to recreate studio sounds, mm -hmm. you know. Otherwise, if I'm playing a gig, I, I really just play the Les Paul into a tape Echoplex, you know, into a 20-watt Marshall, mm -hmm. and that's, that's all you need. depending on what time the show is going to air, but in the past, has been at 10 o'clock I make a production meeting. Mm -hmm. Then I go downstairs to my 
band room and I start writing for the day or for the next day or whatever or for the week or whatever and uh, uh, we break for lunch at one the guys come in and we rehearse from two to four you know and then uh, you know four o'clock we break again and at five o'clock we, we hit the stage for the you know for the pre-show for half an hour 15 20 minutes whatever it is and uh, and then we do a show from 530 to 630 so 9:30 to 6:30, you know, I'm 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 at work, and uh, and then after that I go out and play. My brother Jerry and I had a band that had uh, had uh, the same drummer, keyboard player, and myself. Five of us were the Vivino Brothers band, you know, um, and the other two guys, Mark and Richie, were uh, you know in the Jukes, you know, and I played with them with Johnny before, you know, years ago, uh, knew them you know, from the Jersey scene, you know, and Max, of course, Max is Max, <laughs> you know, Max is the reason that we all got that gig, you know, I mean, that's, that's a fact, you know, him saying, I got a band, and then calling me up and saying, I told him I got a band, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, so I said, so we got a band, let's put, let's put the, let's take these guys and put them together, you can grab a couple guys and we'll, we'll see.